We are, we are in Bellingham, Massachusetts. It's Monday, November 25th, 2013, and this tape is part of the Bellingham Menden Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Marjorie Turner Holman. Our cameraman is Eric Fisher of ABMI Cable 8 TV. We are privileged to have with us today Bob Bartlett of Bellingham. Bob, could you tell us your whole name? My name is Robert, middle name Paul, last name Bartlett. And what is your hometown? Uh, originally from Upton, Massachusetts. I moved into Bellingham in 1976 after I got married. Okay. And do you have any family members besides yourself who uh, served in the military? My father was in the Navy during World War II during the Pacific Campaign. He was uh, stationed on the uh, USS Pasadena, and he was is in charge of the uh, radio room. And uh, he, he uh, ended up getting discharged after the, after the uh, war as a uh, petty officer second class. Mm -hmm. And any other, any other family that served in the military? Uh, the only other person uh, goes way back, my great-grandfather. Uh, fought in the uh, Spanish-American War in Cuba with uh, Teddy Roosevelt. Oh, okay. All right. Now, are you married? Yes, I am. I have my wife, Kathleen, of 38 years. And children? I have three children, all grown up. Uh, I have Tracy, who's uh, age 36. She lives in Worcester. My, my daughter, Amy, and her, and her family live in Milford. And my son, uh, Tim Timothy, which still lives in Bellingham. Okay. All right. And could you tell us what you were doing before you went into the service? I was going to uh, to college, University of Massachusetts in Amherst, and I was studying uh, business marketing. Mm -hmm. And what made you join the military? Well, if you remember during that time period of Vietnam back in 1971, they instituted the draft lottery. And they, uh, and they involuntarily assigned you certain dates based on the, uh, your birth date. Mm -hmm. I ended up with number 21. So there was absolutely no way of my not being inducted into the service. So at that point, I wanted to join the service of my choice rather than them assigning me to the Army. Mm -hmm. So I uh, went in and joined the Navy, and I was fortunate enough to be able to become a, a medical corpsman. Okay. And how old were you when you joined? I was 21. Okay. And uh, what branch of the service did you serve in? Well, I was a uh, medical, uh, medical corpsman. And I, I served uh, in support of the uh, U.S. Marine Corps for 21 years. But you weren't service, actually... In the reserve service. Okay, but you weren't actually in the Marines. No, I was not. The Marines do not have their own medical corps. So the Navy supports the U.S. Marines with their corpsmen, their field medical corpsmen. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and tell us about boot camp. Boot camp was very interesting because it was a boot camp that was held down in Memphis, Tennessee. And it was an old setup. It had World War II barracks. And I remember the pictures and the stories they used to tell us about no smoking, no open fires inside the barracks because I showed one of the, that type of barracks that previously two years before had caught on fire and it was so dry and so so much of a tinder that a lot of the medical, uh, not the medical person, but a lot of the military personnel that are in that building never made it out. Wow. And they try to stress for us not to be smoking inside the building because they showed pictures of the charred remains oh, gosh. and it had quite an effect. I would think so. Mm -hmm. And now you were in the reserve. Yes. So, um, what what did that tell me about being in the reserve? You um, 
You didn't ever actually go to Vietnam. No, uh, I signed up for the reserves at, at the Worcester plant, at the Plantation Street uh, building for the Navy Reserves. And uh, by signing up with the reserves, uh, after I went through my on-the-job training, which involved boot camp, then uh, Corman School, which was in Great Lakes, Illinois, and then they sent us down for OJT down at the Portsmouth Naval Hospital in Norfolk, Virginia. What are those initials stand for? On the job training. Okay. Mm -hmm. It gave us it gave us training for for actual actual uh, medical care of uh, patients within a hospital. Mm -hmm. And after the after I completed that that stint, uh, I was sent down to uh, field medical training down in Camp Geiger and Camp Lejeune. North Carolina. Mm -hmm. I was fortunate in that a lot of the people that were that were there received orders upon their graduation to, to report directly to units in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. Since I was a reservist, I, or, or, I my orders had already been cut for me to return to Worcester and report to the regimental headquarters for the Marine Corps in Worcester. So I was able to come home and start my reserve duty at home rather than being sent to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. But then you stayed in the reserves. Yes, I remained in the reserves. You never, unless you re-enlist uh, re to become an active duty person, you, you remain in the reserves. And I was, I did receive orders, our uh, entire unit did receive orders two different times to be activated and sent to Vietnam, but in both cases they were they were canceled before being sent out so we were mm -hmm. very fortunate in that matter mm -hmm. but I remained in the reserves all the time that I was in the service okay um, now tell me about the training that you received at 29 Palms because that was part of your reserve training right uh, every every year we would have two two weeks of military training whether it be in uh, mountain training, desert training, jungle training, or whatever. Uh, I had received three different stints of two weeks of training at Desert uh, at uh, 29 Palms. 29 Palms is the desert training facility for the Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. It's also a live fire base. Wow. So while you're going through your training, there is live fire that is happening as part, part of your training there. So mm -hmm. it is quite extensive and quite hot. <laughs> How hot was it? <laughs> well, the average temperature during the day would be somewhere between 135 and 150 degrees. Wow. So it is at these types of training exercises that we learned how to hydrate the bodies so that you do not go into heat stroke or heat exhaustion. And for those people who didn't listen to the uh, training and decided that they were Mr. Macho, we had to treat them because they did go into heat stroke and heat exhaustion. Which gave you practice. Yes, <laughs> it certainly did. Oh, dear. Uh, and what year was that that you did the training there? Uh, that was in uh, probably during the 90s. I'm not sure exactly what what date it was, but it started started probably in the late '90s and went until the mid uh, mid 2000s. Okay. Now, tell me where you were deployed and for how, how how long. Tell me about where 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 you were deployed to. Well, when I when I got the activated, I uh, for for uh, the uh, Persian Gulf, the first war. Uh, we we got activated the day after Thanksgiving. Of, of which year? Of 2000 and, oh, I'm sorry. I got that followed up. Ni uh, 1990. Mm-hmm. Okay. 1990. Mm -hmm. And uh, we got activated the day after Thanksgiving. We got flown down to uh, North Carolina, and th those were individual orders. They weren't a unit activation. And I got a get assigned to the First Battalion Marines, 
that were that were the reserve battalion from New England. Mm -hmm. Well, tell me tell me about some of what you did once you were deployed. Well, once once we got there, uh, I ended up being assigned as the lead petty officer officer for the uh, battalion aid station. Our primary mission while we were at Lejeune for for three weeks was to ready all the personnel within the battalion for overseas deployment. Mm -hmm. That meant uh, updating their health records, updating their dental exams, updating their uh, their vaccinations. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a full time job for three weeks mm -hmm. because you basically had you had five hundred people that you had to bring up to snuff before they went overseas. Mm -hmm. And you received every vaccination that you could ever imagine, mm -hmm. including typhoid and you name it. Mm -hmm. But once you were, and when you went overseas, where did you go? Did you? We landed uh, in, in a military airport just outside of El Jabal in Saudi Arabia. Uh, when we got there, uh, we had originally been slated to do to have a rear deployment area for support of the uh, active duty personnel, but the issue the issue that was brought up to General Boomer, who happened to be the uh, division division one uh, commanding officer of the Marine Corps, was that our battalion was one of only two reserve battalions out of the fourth division that had been classified as combat ready. As soon as he heard that our battalion was coming in to Saudi Arabia, our orders immediately got changed. So that evening is when we landed, we were immediately boarded on buses, and we were on our way north to the 1st Division headquarters, which was about 50 miles south of Kuwait. Okay. And this was all because of um, Iraq having invaded Kuwait? Yes. This, okay. Yes, it was, and his refusal to uh, withdraw. Mm -hmm. okay. We originally were in a uh, station, stations to uh, defend Saudi Arabia from any any aggression from from the Iraqis, but we were also getting staged and armed for an armed assault if he refused to to withdraw from Kuwait. Mm -hmm. okay. So we did we got did that for about three weeks prior to the beginning of the air war. Mm -hmm. And how long did you actually stay in, in Kuwait? Kuwait itself, I did not stay very long. Uh, the Marines went in the 22nd of February, and we were back back out by the end of February. The war was so over. The war was over. They had stopped us from going into Iraq, and, and we were already on the way back to our base camp. They'd stopped from going Arabia. into Baghdad? Are you? Yes. Okay. Both Marine divisions were side by side going up beside the uh, the main highway to enter into Iraq when we got stopped about a quarter of a mile from the Iraqi border. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, tell me about um, some of the living conditions in Kuwait. Well, the base camp was pretty much luxurious in that we had rows <laughs> and rows of, of uh, general purpose tents that we stayed in. But once we moved out of the base camp and moved, moved towards the uh, Iraq, uh, to Kuwaiti border, this was our accommodations on a nightly basis. We had to dig holes into the ground and set up shelter halves over the holes for shelter f for overnight. The reason we did this is that the winds would, would pick up on a daily basis and if the lower you had your shelter half, the more likely it was going to stay intact. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it could just blow off into the desert and you'd never see it again. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't fun digging those holes because contrary to people's belief, it's not like the, not like the deserts of, the, uh, of, the, of North Africa. You have sand for about the first loose sand for about the first six to 12 inches. And after that, you have limestone. 
Really? And you used to have to use an, an axe and a pick in order to be able to dig the hole deep enough for your self-protection. But then you're sleeping on limestone. Uh, yes, you are. <laughs> that sounds hard. Well, you have a sleeping bag that you sleep on, that you lay out on top of it. But yes, it is hard. Mm -hmm. Okay. But a lot of a lot of people like myself would uh, bring in what I would consider a luxury. We'd have a blow-up pillow for the head. Mm -hmm. And when you pack up, you just deflate it, put it in your Alice pack, and bring it with you. Mm -hmm. And that, that was heaven. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell me some of the experiences that made it clear to you that you were living in a war zone. Some of the experiences. <clears throat> well, one example would be uh, just before we stepped off into the ground war, I was sent back with a, with a bunch of my corpsmen. Mm. And this, this was one of our forward, forward locations before we went into Kuwait. That was the battalion aid station that's in the center. Uh, everyone, everyone else involved with the battalion is in holes around. You can, you can see small specks on the, on the left-hand horizon and the right-hand horizon. That, that's the rest of the Marines dug in into the ground. We, we ended up digging ourselves into the ground once we left this location towards the actual border itself. But until then, we were under the camouflage in the tents. Uh, when we went back for resupplies, now we hadn't been resupplied with medicals, medical equipment since, uh, since we had gotten there. <clears throat> what we had been working with is everything we had brought with us from the States which was pretty much depleted over the course of five or six weeks. So we got sent back with, with our six-by trucks to go to Al Jabal, where the main supply depot was. For, and our medical, medical supply was also back there. And funny story. We were on the way down to Al Jabal, and it was during Ramadan. And the Saudis are very, very strict of what can and cannot be done during Ramadan. So we were about two-thirds of the way down to Al-Jabal, which is about 100, 125 miles south of where we were. And all of a sudden, we have this vehicle behind us with a light pulling us over. So we pulled over. And everything. Now, this was after the air war had already started. So at that point, we had our, all our weapons with us. They were loaded and on safe and sitting at our feet. Well, this religious police officer from Saudi Arabia with his partner walk up to the back of the truck. And now, Americans like their music. And we brought with us a boombox, and we were playing a tape on the boombox. Well, they took offense to this, and they insisted that they were going to confiscate the boombox from us. It didn't happen, because when we picked up all our weapons, they got into their car, and they took off the other way so fast, that all you could see was a dust storm. Mm -hmm. And we had a good laugh over that. But there's one, one thing we were told, the Saudis may be our allies in the war, but don't trust them. And it was true. Hmm. Because they had a listening post outside of division headquarters, and we weren't sure what they were doing there until we had one of, our, one of the Marine spider patrols dig a tunnel down underneath the listening post and start listening to what they were saying. And they were listening in, try, trying to get information from the division headquarters. Well, they were very surprised when the spider patrol popped up through the ground in the middle of their tent. And they were moved 10 miles down the road. <laughs> what, what do you think they would, well, that's. <laughs> we were there to help protect their, protect their country, but they still had 
they still had the same issue of us being American and there being a Arabs. Okay. And they didn't trust us, we didn't trust them. Mm -hmm. So the best way to maintain civility mm -hmm. between the two different military areas was to maintain the distance. Well, tell me some more about, um, you were there during the armed conflicts, but how, I mean, tell me, there were prisoners of war, there were, you dealt with injured, p injuries, tell right. me. Right, uh, I have, our main function while we were, while we were in the ground war was we split up into two, two different medical groups. One was to take care of the the prisoners of war, the Iraqi prisoners of war that were, going, that were being captured by the Marines. And the other one was to uh, maintain the, the uh, medical support for the Marines as they were going through their normal uh, military maneuvers. I was uh, involved in the medical support where, the, where they had the Iraqi POWs. And they were very, uh, very, very appreciative of anything you did for him. But at the same time, we were just not, we were, weren't just treating the POWs. We were also involved in going, going out in patrols into the oil fields, which was right beside us, and, uh, and looking for any stragglers, addressing any, any uh, attacks that may come, come towards us, looking for uh, bunkers, so we were we were actively in a combat role as well. Mm -hmm. Well, you t you talked about you could hear tanks coming in oh. the desert. There was a we were dug in we were dug in one night, like like you s saw there with the with the tent on the ground. Except when you're when you're in a combat role, the uh, tents the shelter halves the covers just don't happen. So you're down in the foxhole, and there's two for, for foxhole, and you set up a defensive perimeter during the evening. Well, this one particular night, we were facing in towards the Greater Bagan oil field, and we could hear tanks in front of us. Now, the only tanks that are going to be in front of us is going to be Iraqi tanks or, or Soviet tanks that they've gotten from mm -hmm. for Iraq. And suddenly... We, we could hear behind us more tanks. And we weren't sure, but we sounded, it sounded as if we were in the wrong place. And as it turned out, there were A1 Abrams behind us that were in full speed assault into the oil fields towards this other tank brigade. Uh, I would have to say that that particular instance was, was probably the most scary incident of the entire war for me. Because I ducked and a tank track went right over my head, right over my foxhole. Didn't have any spare clothes, but I tell you, there, there was a little bit of rinsing that happened the next day. <laughs> that, was, that was a scary situation when, you, when you're seeing it. A large size A1 Abrams. I don't know if you've ever seen them, but they are huge. Mm -hmm. And you see this track that's about three feet wide going right over your head. That's when you were happy that you were dug into limestone so it wouldn't sink in. Mm -hmm. Wow. Goodness. Um, well, you've told me some funny stories, but there, tell me. We have another picture of something that was pretty funny that I know amused you. So tell me something else that there was. <laughs> there. Yes, tell us about this picture. When we had first moved out of the main base camp and were setting up for the assault in the, in the media camp, which, which you saw a, a previous picture of where the BAS, the battalion aid station, was in a tent and all the Marines were all dug in. That was prior to getting going to the sand dunes where the, uh, we were br breaking in. Uh, we were trying to amuse ourselves. And when you had to go to the bathroom in that type of situation, you end up digging a hole, doing your business, 
and then having to fill it up again. Well, we decided we wanted a little bit of luxury out there. So we had some fun. We filled a bunch of sandbags and we made ourselves a lounge john. <laughs> sandbags that were, had the backrest, had the armrest, cup holder, magazine holder. So what you saw there was, was a sandbag generated lounge chair over a hole for a toilet that we were using out in the middle of the desert. And it was, it was sort of a very, very unique situation. And that's a lot of the people that you saw in that picture were involved in the digging and the setting up of the sandbags and everything. And, and uh, we'd just go out in the middle of the desert and sit down in the chair, read a magazine, and do what we had to do. We set that up as an enlisted toilet only. We had several officers that wanted to partake in our lounge chair, but we refused to let them in. Listed only. Oh, golly. Well, now you had some interesting POWs. You had you learned some things when you w worked with the when you encountered the POWs that you treated. Um, tell tell us a little bit about that. One in particular. Well, we had thousands of POWs. They were coming in by the by the hundreds at a time. But this one particular. Iraqi officer came up and introduced himself. And he spoke perfect English. So we started getting the story from him. He was a doctor that, that works in Chicago in the emergency room in one of the ma major hospitals in Chicago. But he had his mother and father that still lived in Iraq. Well, when he went back to visit his mother and father, they refused to let him go back home. And he got inducted into the army as a doctor. So he was stuck in the, not only the Iran-Iraq war, but also in the war that we were currently in as being a doctor for Iraq. So we immediately asked him if he would like to come and work with us and we would make sure that he would be able to return back to the United States. So he was overjoyed. So he worked with us as a doctor, and he was perfectly qualified being an emergency room doctor for uh, trauma medicine. Mm. And, uh, and he had a good time. He, we, we kept him out of the POW area, uh, actually gave him, gave him uh, clothes that uh, signified that he was not a POW. And he stayed with us. We set him up. And when we went back, when we finally went back to, uh, to Saudi Arabia to our base tank, he came back with us and arrangements were made for him to be air flighted out to the nearest, nearest airport to be sent back home. Wow. But he was a, extremely happy to see us. I bet. You, you made reference to the Iran-Iraq conflict and you talked about some of the things that you treated, not only um, illnesses, but you also talked about injuries. That we, had, we were treating wound inju injuries that re originated from the Iran-Iraq war, which were never totally treated properly. We had Iraqi soldiers coming in with gangrene that was a result of improper treatment mm -hmm. during the Iran-Iraq war. Mm -hmm. And they were still in the service because once they got in the service, there was no getting out. Oh. But uh, <clears throat> we, we found that we had to do uh, a lot of major trauma medicine for them and then send them back for, for further hospital treatment mm -hmm. because, because they were never proper, uh, properly treated by their own Iraqi armies. Oh. And we had about every major disease known to man from the third, third uh, from basically the undeveloped countries. Mm -hmm. We saw stuff there that we had only read books in, uh, uh, read about in books that we had to treat, wow. treat them for. And uh, it was quite an experience. <clears throat> you must have felt like you were being helpful. 
Ah, I hope I hope we were. Because a lot of the POWs were scared stiff of us. Why why is that? Because they were told stories from by Saddam Hussein and his commanding officers that the US Marine Corps was to be absolutely scared of. They were told that in order to become eligible to go to boot camp for the US Marine Corps, we had to have killed one of our family members. And they thought that was terrible. And they thought for sure we were gonna we were gonna execute all of them. Let's be be clear, this is not what the Marines require of boot camp people. No, absolutely not. Oh, good. Absolutely not. <laughs> Just wanted to be clear. <laughs> All right. Oh, golly. Um, well, can you talk about how, how it was for your family with you being away, <clears throat> de deployed to, to... Well, my three daughters were in school. My two daughters and my son were in school. One was uh, in middle school and the other... Uh, the other two were still in elementary school, and uh, they they heard the entire gamut. Oh. S support. Uh, those there are the three are. of them now. Yeah. My daughter on the left, Tracy. She was in middle school, and then my son Tim, and then Amy. They was they were still in the elementary school at Macy School, and uh, they were told every story that you can imagine. You know how to. They should be patriotic, support the troops, which was fine. But then. There were the other the other end ends of the story too, where we should be ashamed that we're over there fighting a war. We have no no place to being over there, and they were which way to go. Well, my wife my wife helped us make sure that they stayed on the right track, as far as I was concerned, <laughs> and uh, and uh, they they. Uh, were very supportive of what I was doing, and I would try to keep in contact with them as much as I could. About once a week, I would uh, call up using the satellite phones that they had set up at the division headquarters, and uh, I would talk to them in the morning before they went to school, because I would be talking late in the evening, and they, they would be getting ready for going to school, and try to keep in contact with them until the point that I had to move out to an advanced area, then we had to we had to uh, s say uh, goodbyes, and uh, I will contact him as soon as I get back. Mm -hmm. Now, you said something about your um, your enlistment came up, or that you your twenty <laughs> years came up while you were deployed. Before we before we stepped off into one of the advanced areas, my enlistment came to an end for for twenty years, and I had not re-upped for another. Two or, two or four years. So I went to the colonel of our, of our battalion and I says, Colonel, he says, my enlistment just, just uh, expired today. He says, when can I have a plane to go back home? <laughs> and he just looked at me and chuckled and says, this is wartime, son. He says, you were involuntarily extended four years yesterday by my signature. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. But it didn't end up being four no, years. No, it wasn't. It was just during the conflict, and I stayed for about, I stayed in the reserves for about one more year. Then I, then it was time for me to retire because I wanted to be home for the kids. Mm -hmm. They were going into high school. A lot of activities they were going through, and I felt felt as if twenty one years was enough time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now you may mentioned Macy School that your children. We're at, and you talked about some of the letters and, and a, a tape that they sent I received you. a packet of, of letters from uh, a couple of the classes at the Macy School, and the, uh, the corpsmen that were with me were enthralled with the letters. So they were each taking three or four letters, and they were responding back to the letters, and they were having a good time doing that. But included within that packet at the time, Mrs. Packard was the was the principal of Macy School. Annette Packard. And they had mm -hmm. a s special concert at the school that ended up being dedicated to me being out in the Persian Gulf. Mm -hmm. 
And it was a cassette tape with a concert, and they, and they went through the whole thing, you know, saying that this is being dedicated to you when they had all the patriotic songs. And I would, I would play that on that boom box that mm -hmm. I told you about earlier. And other guys that were with me would start crying. <laughs> it, was an abs it was an absolute uh, shock to them that I was able to get something like that from my hometown. Mm -hmm. And I still have that tape. I never got rid of it. I showed it to you the other mm -hmm. day. Mm -hmm. And the letters. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That was amazing. Um, well, could you tell me something positive that you've, you can, you've taken from your military experience? Well, I, one thing that uh, I, I learned from my military exp experience is that uh, I learned leadership, for one thing. And I've learned to be decisive and not be wishy-washy. Mm -hmm. uh, you, can't, you can't be wishy-washy in the military, especially during a combat situation. You have to evaluate the situation that you're in, make a decision, and stick to it and go to it. And, and how, did, how did you learn that? It's a matter of not, you know, the, the upper leadership doesn't have very much tolerance for any type of uh, uh, indecisiveness. So you learn in order to keep the upper leadership happy that you have to react in a, in a fashion that's going to be decisive and positive and you're going to be able to manage the people underneath you. Mm -hmm. So in that fashion, it was uh, very positive for me because I was able to bring that home and be able to apply it to where I worked, organizations I belonged to, and uh, it's ju it just was a positive thing for me that mm -hmm. I brought home that way. Okay. Now, you described encountering some different customs. You talked about meeting those um, the religious police, but um, can you talk? to me a little bit about, you talked about something about the role of men and women and swimming and going to a swimming pool and what? <laughs> when we came back from, uh, from Kuwait, uh, we were now in the mode that we were going to start getting the personnel ready for bringing back to the, uh, going back to the United States and getting discharged. So that was our main focus after we got back to the main, main divisional camp, is that everyone had to have their discharge physical set up and they had to, uh, any type of uh, medical issues are addressed at that point. And we worked pretty hard at doing that. So they decided that they were going to give, give everyone in the battalion over the course of two different days a Liberty Day. So they, was, they set up a, a trip to go down to Al Jabal, and they had reserved the use of one of King Fahd's swimming pools. Mm -hmm. Very nice yeah. setup. There it is. Yeah. Yeah. Very nice setup. It had concession <laughs> stands. Uh, at, it was a beautiful, beautiful setup. But the customs of Saudi Arabia are still the old style Arab customs. Women are not to be, are not to have fun with the men. They are to be subservient. Uh, women can go out and go out for entertainment with other women but not with the men. Mm -hmm. Well being non-Arab and from the United States, we're accustomed having women with us and having fun. So on the way down to, uh, to this pool for the day, I end we ended up uh, stopping by. Now there were some women Marines that went out with us to the deployment and they were working different positions in the rear, in the rear units. Mm -hmm. uh, whether it was a library or whatever, whatever it was they were working with. So we picked them up on the bus and we brought them with us to the pool. 
and they had their bathing suits as well as us having cutoffs and everything, and they went in swimming with us. Well, there were some Arabian workers that were at the pool serving us that were absolutely flabbergasted. How could this be? This is not supposed to happen. But it didn't stop us. <laughs> as much as they complained, we just it just it just made us more gave us more resolve to be Americans. I see. Okay. <coughs> um, now, was there anything else that you wanted to talk about that I haven't asked you about? Is there anything else that you wanted to add into this? I've been been asked by a lot of a lot of children if I killed anyone. And that is a question I never have answered to this date. The only answer I will give them to that, that type of question is that if someone's going to shoot at me, I'm going to defend myself. And I leave it at that. Mm -hmm. And then they ask me, did you defend yourself? I says, yes. But I won't say. Mm -hmm anything else other than that. Mm -hmm. Because when I was out there, our TO weapon for the for uh, uh, military corpsmen is a 9mm pistol. That's useless when you got a when you got an AR-15 pointed at you being being shot at you. Or, Those are rocket launchers? Or? Uh, no, rocket launchers would be the uh, would be uh, some of their uh, some of the old Soviet rocket launches, okay. but we, I ended up picking up an M16 along with my pistol, and I had some laws and an A4 rocket launches in my backpack. And going through the patrols into the in the uh, in the oil fields, I did have to resupply myself with those rockets several times. Okay. But like I said, if they're going to shoot at me. I'm going to defend myself. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing with us, Bob, and for helping your stories become part of the permanent record of the Library of Congress Veterans Oral History Project. And that concludes our interview. You're absolutely welcome.